Welcome to this podcast for Pentecost 8, uh, namely Series A Gospel Reading for Pentecost 8, which is Matthew 13, verses 44 to 52. Not a long reading, but several short parables are found in this uh, reading. So we're building off of some of the previous weeks where we've had these, these uh, parables from this key discourse in the Gospel of Matthew, namely the Kingdom of the Heavens Discourse, chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew. And here we have several parables that have to do with buying. And before we get to the Greek text, I just want to make an important point, is there are a lot of commentaries where, that get these parables wrong. Why? They tend to view the action of the person who gives up something and buys as the action of an individual Christian. If we keep in mind that the parables are describing the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God is the reign of, of God or the reign of the heavens that is being brought to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ and that they are illustrating primarily God's work in Jesus Christ, then we should see that the key actor in these parables is none other than the Son of God. And then we'll get it right. We'll get it right in terms of our preaching of this. Why? Because we'll be focusing primarily on what God has done for us in Jesus, not just on what an individual Christian does. Uh, so, the, the, uh, getting to these parables, keep in mind who's the key actor? Jesus. And let's go to the Greek text here. I just highlighted in light blue the fact that you have several parables being introduced and you have that stylistic phrase that we've become used to in Matthew with homoia, which is a signal of a simile, namely the phrase is like. You have the verb there is and the kingdom of the heavens. Uh, so the kingdom of the heavens is like, you see that here in verse 44, again in verse 45, again in verse 47, and then again in verse 51. Four different short uh, parables. I would say if I'm preaching uh, on these verses 44 and 45, and then the next parable, about the par which is the parable of the, of the treasure in the field, and then the next parable, which is the pearl of great price, those are very closely related, very easy to preach on together because they both involve the imagery of something that's very special, one case a treasure, the second case a pearl of great price, and they have somebody selling everything and buying that. So it's a very powerful atonement image. You see that language of selling, or excuse me, of buying right here. And that's language that one can say is great opportunity for we Lutherans to preach Christ's work of buying us, of atoning for our sins, paying for our sins. So we start off with this uh, first one. The kingdom of the heavens is like, and then you have this language of a treasure, and then a perfect tense participle. Uh, so it's interesting that it's perfect in the sense that it has already been hidden. You see the reduplication there uh, of, the, uh, of the, the, the verb, and it's in the participle form. So it has been hidden long before you have this uh, man coming along. It has been hidden where? In a field. We remember from last week, uh, Jesus explained the, the parable of the weeds and the wheat uh, as specifically as they were, the good seed was sown in the field, the field is the world. So here I think it's a good uh, way of just seeing uh, that same kind of referent is true here, that the, the field is the world. So it has been hidden in the world. So what does he need to do? Uh, uh, you have a man after finding, so you have your participle there, um, he hides it. So he finds the treasure and hides it. And we'll get into, in a moment, why does he do this? Well, he can't legitimately take the treasure like a pirate. He needs to actually buy the field because whatever is um, found in that field then belongs to him. So he can't just take the treasure. He has to go buy the whole field. 
Uh, and so uh, he basically, from the joy, so this is an interesting reference, and I think it's the, the emphasis on the treasure is something that is so valuable, he brings, it brings him much joy. So what does he do? He basically goes out and he sells everything that he has. And this is a very important phrase. And you see it in both of these parables, this business about, about uh, selling. Uh, you see it again in the par parable of the, uh, of the pearl of great price. Selling everything that he has, giving up everything. And I would argue that this is an image for what Jesus did in emptying himself, in giving up everything, and giving his whole self is a, is a payment for sin. And then, so it's, it's emphasizing the giving up of everything. And this isn't emphasizing what a Christian does uh, in order to be converted. No, this is illustrating what God does in the person of Jesus, who basically becomes incarnate, lives for us, dies for us, rises again. Again, not for himself, but he does all of this for us. And then what does he do after he sells Panta, everything that he has? He then buys the field. And this is interesting. He's not just buying the little postage stamp where the treasure is. He's buying the field. And we could say that this is a way to, to illustrate universal atonement. Because if we understand the field to be the world, then what Jesus does is he buys the whole world through his atoning death so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, it's speaking really, one might say, of the fact that he has atoned for all sins. Every sinner has been bought by him so that those who, are, who do come to faith uh, have the benefit of what he has done for the whole world. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, a, a, a parable that actually illustrates, and certainly you can read about this also in Gibbs' commentary, it's a parable that illustrates universal atonement. He buys that field, and then what does he do? Uh, he basically then owns the treasure. Uh, and the treasure can be seen as a picture for the church, which is in the world. So uh, he buys the whole world, he pays for the sins of all, so that whoever believe in him, really, which are the treasure that will benefit from that universal atonement, um, that, that uh, he has that, uh, and they are in fellowship with him forever. The next parable is very closely related to it, same kind of imagery, little distinct details, but you have, again, uh, Jesus is uh, just telling similar theological point, but uh, using a little different illustration. The kingdom of the heavens is like, we have that phrase repeated, a man who is a merchant. So this is a merchant man. And uh, he has been seeking, seeking out what? Uh, a uh, a calus, uh, uh, good pearls. So he's been seeking out very uh, nice pearls. But then, after finding the one pearl that is priceless. So here, it's like the, the uh, very special pearl. Very much you know, like the image here that we saw of the treasure. Here is the image of the priceless pearl. This isn't describing what an individual person does, that then they, they somehow find Jesus and they give up everything to, uh, to follow him. This is a picture of what Jesus has done, who sees the church, sells all in order to, to, uh, to purchase. Uh, here you have, the uh, what does he do? So after he um, goes off, he sells everything he has. We saw that uh, same image a little bit earlier in this uh, earlier parable. And what does he do? He buys. Again, that imagery that we see of buying is an image of atonement, making payment. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he offered his life as a payment for sin. He makes payment. Why? So that 
that um, pearl of great price may be his, uh, that we uh, as the church may be his. Uh, he's purchased, one might say, through the first parable, the whole world, so that we are, may be his. And again, you have uh, him going on telling another parable that builds on these, but is a little bit more in the direction of end time judgment. Here we can say it's, uh, the first two parables are illustrating what God has done in Jesus to, um, and how precious we are in the sense that we are the treasure, we are the pearl of great price, that he has given up everything uh, through his, his life for us, his death for us, his resurrection for us to purchase. Now we have more of a shift towards the, the end time judgment. So you have in verse 7, um, uh, 30, 47, you have again, the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, and here you have the image of, uh, of throwing a net right here, uh, throwing it, there's your, your verb, into the sea. So here is an image of end time judgment, of um, uh, how God will bring about uh, uh, the gathering of the harvest we saw in an earlier parable. Here it's the image of, of gathering in the net of the catch. And so you have, through that casting of the net, uh, what is brought in, you have, um, you have basically, uh, they, um, they catch uh, in the end of verse 47, you have them gathering fish right here, gathering right here fish of every kind. So just this huge um, gathering. Uh, we have that image earlier in the Gospels of being fishers of men, and this is speaking about the end time gathering uh, in judgment. So it's not so much speaking about at all about conversion, but rather the gathering of all people in judgment. This is sort of another picture for what Jesus says in the prophetic narrative He's going to gather people and separate them as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. Here, it's, he's going to gather all the fish and separate the, the fish, the good from the bad, so to speak, the believers from the unbelievers. And that's what's brought out a bit then in verse 48, where you have the emphasis of uh, after the, the net has been drawn up right here, you have the anabino, it's being drawn up upon the shore right there. Uh, then after those who draw it up have been seated, then what do they do? They separate the, 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 um, the uh, good ones into uh, containers. And then what do they do with the other ones? The other ones, the, uh, the bad ones, they throw out right here. Uh, ebalon, they throw them where? Uh, exo, they throw them out. So there is the separation and the sense of picture for the judgment. And that's uh, emphasized here with verse 49. So it is with the conclusion right here of the age. So this is speaking about the last day when you have the angels coming. Uh, there they will come. Here you have the future of uh, echo, uh, uh, echo my. Uh, you have the uh, they will come. And what will they do? They're going, to, um, uh, they're going to separate. That's the verb right here. They will separate the evil ones from the midst of the righteous ones, from out of the midst of the righteous ones. So this is that language that we saw in an earlier parable about the weeds and the wheat. Similar um, language here. In verse 50, uh, you have the emphasis, they are going to throw them into the furnace of fire. Again, we saw that in the weeds and the wheat parable a little earlier, Pentecost 7. We see it again in this parable. Uh, and there, here is also, there will be the weeping uh, one and then the gnashing of teeth one. So there will be, the emphasis is not just some kind of annihilation, some kind of neutral zone, but rather this is a, a, a punishment. This is suffering. This is judgment that uh, goes on for eternity. So the image there of, um, of weeping and gnashing of teeth 
brings that out in a very powerful way. Verse 51 goes on. Jesus asked the question, have you understood these, all these things? Uh, it's a rhetorical question. What did they say to him? Of course, yes. Now, they may not understand all the details, but fortunately he has explained a couple of the parables, so they're starting to put things together a little bit. This is probably a little optimistic of how they answer, but uh, obviously after his death and resurrection, uh, all this stuff starts coming together more for them as it does for us now who stand on the other side of Jesus' death and resurrection. We can understand this purchasing language better because we, we see the whole picture of his life and how he purchased the world through his, his death, and we are the, the precious treasure, the priceless pearl. And then what does he say to them? We have one final image that he concludes with in verse 52. Uh, On account of this dia tuta, every uh, grammatois, um, uh, here you have the image of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, every discipling, uh, scribe. Uh, so um, uh, it's a picture really of somebody who is who is uh, a scribe that's been discipled or trained for what? The kingdom of the heavens. So this is especially applicable to, uh, to um, the twelve, but it's also applicable to apostolic ministers and certainly in a broader way even to all Christians. They're, they're like a man who is, um, uh, who is the householder whom uh, throws out of his, uh, here I would say, his treasure, or takes out of his treasure both things that are new and old. Now the ironic thing is we would expect that he would say old first and then new. Uh, but really what's being emphasized here is that when we are, are um, a student of the scriptures and a follower of Jesus, we have this wonderful treasure to share. And the primary thing is the new stuff that we have learned, but also the old stuff from the Old Testament. So when Jesus' disciples are hearing this, They've learned some new things in the sense of the revelation that has been given them by Jesus, but they also have the foundation of the Old Testament. And they are to go and share these things because they have this great treasure now to share. And they're going to pull out from that treasure both things that are new from the teaching of Jesus and things that are old. And we could say, you know, we have the blessing of both the Old Testament and also the New Testament revelation, namely the teaching of Jesus, the life of Jesus. And so we pull from that as we proclaim and share the kingdom. We, we draw on both testaments, and we pull out those treasures, and we share with them as, um, as scribes who have, been, uh, who have been discipled in the kingdom of the heavens. May the Lord bless your proclamation of these parables and especially the emphasis on what God has done in Jesus in giving up everything and purchasing us and how precious we are. Why? So that he can deliver us from the end time judgment and we will have eternal fellowship with him.